So first question, what fascinated you during the process of creating this film and speaking through the main characters, both of whom are women? Well, um, I knew that I wanted to write a movie about siblings and it was uh, initially sort of irrelevant to me whether they were brothers or sisters or a mix. And so at the time I figured, well, I'll just make them sisters um, almost arbitrarily. And then I knew Bayes and Allie as actors and knew that they would be perfect and was excited to write for their voices together. And after that, it just kind of came really easy. Excellent. So since this is so oriented to Chicago and the Midwest, what is the most Chicago slash Midwestern characteristic about the women and the atmosphere they reside in? As you know, certainly in Beta, she has that kind of Midwestern um, niceness or, or politeness, you know, a <laughs> yeah. desire to kind of tamp down her personality. And, and conversely, Zelda is probably rebelling against that, that instinct um, of that kind of nice Midwestern girl. Uh, but at the same time, she is a very warm, you know, in a lot of ways, much warmer character than Beta to other people, interestingly. So it's um, kind of different, you know, the whole movie is different, the same, them reacting differently to the same stimuli. Um, what I found remarkable about the women in the film was their constant harassment from the world of men in their lives, mm -hmm. that even was destructive for Zelda. What gap of attitude between men and women were you trying to uh, spotlight? with the actions of the sisters? They're basically, I mean, they are proactive in the movie, but they, they, you know, they come up against a lot of different people, mostly men that they have to react to, you know, decide to either get away from or, or team up with. <laughs> and and um, I was aware while writing it that just on a purely metaphorical symbolic level, a story about two women searching for a man to give their lives meaning or protection, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that that carried implications with it. And that m me as a male filmmaker to be telling this story, I opted to try to be aware of that and lean into it a little bit. So it wasn't even like uh, totally thought out, but as I was writing those aspects, um, you know, that I was, my friend Jessica described the script as the male gaze gazing on the male gaze, which I really <laughs> like. Excellent. Um, the way you costume the women was part of their characters. In your experience, how does costuming help an actor understand a role? And how, you're, how was your costuming of the sisters communicating their motivations? Um, that's a good question. Costuming is, you know, as an actor, if you are wearing dress shoes versus flip-flops, that's gonna affect everything that you do, how your body moves, how you carry yourself, the energy right. you have. And so those kinds of things are very important and I think very helpful to an actor uh, to have those. We were on a very limited budget and we did have um, a costumer, but we were basically taking items from um, the actor's own wardrobes. Uh, so we we kind of had a you know tried on a bunch of different things and decided collectively with with the actors as well with their input and what they liked and sure these are just things that I I noticed. <laughs> yeah. How did you and Nate Kurtzellers strategize the look of the film? Was it designed to establish a world that was partially surreal in the film noir environment? Nate's a brilliant cinematographer and he loves to to talk about it as well. And he's very, um, he was very gracious with me, you know, sort of teaching me things about cinematography as we were working. But I had strong aesthetic opinions about the films that I liked and the kind of um, way I wanted it to look. And we, we swapped a ton of film stills that we liked and discussed why we liked them and broke them down and kind of came up with a, you know, kind of a palette that we, that we liked. But that was more in the sort of somber, um, you know, dark browns and, and woods, wood color and, and things like that. Kudos to Nate. Yeah, he's great.
You scored one of the greatest underrated character actors of his era, Austin Pendleton, for a crucial role. What was, uh, what had been your relationship with him? How were you able to approach him for the film? And what did you observe about his years of experience that made his performance so crucial to the story? Well, obviously it's an important character in the film um, that a lot of hype is, is built up around. So we wanted somebody that um, could, could really nail it, as well as somebody that audiences would potentially um, recognize, even if they didn't quite know where they knew him from. Obviously, a lot of people will know where they know him from, but a lot of people will just say, you know, I've, I've seen this, this person before, which we kind of liked. But he had a relation, he has a longstanding relationship with Alex Thompson. Uh. And Alex, years ago, I'm a musician as well, and Alex directed um, a handful of music videos for me. Oh. And it's, it's how he and I started working together originally. And he got Austin to be in one of the music videos, which is a lovely um, video, probably my favorite of them. And he was just so gracious about it. And so we always kind of had him in the back of our minds as we'll probably just ask Austin and he'll probably say yes. You know, he's, he's the kind of person who will just say, you, you asked me to do something. I can't remember what it was, but, but that's fine. You know, <laughs> which is exactly what I expect Austin Pendleton yes. to say. <laughs> As a musician, your character is sad, Brad. How do you evoke that character and other elements of your creative life, like filmmaking and uh, acting? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just it's you know the name Sad Brad came because I was self conscious about the kind of sad, you know sad bastard nature of, of my songs, and I wanted to get out ahead of any criticism. But, <laughs> but I, I am sad. I mean, I feel I consider myself sad. And, uh, but I'm also, I think, a, a funny person. And I don't, I don't stop making jokes when I'm sad. Do you know what I mean? It's yes. th they coexist at the same time. So, yes. so the sad Brad name is kind of goofy, but it's also it's it's legit. It's real. That's and awesome. the same thing with our father. I feel like some people jive with it, and some people don't. That, to have those two things happening at the same time, and for me, it would feel like a weird exercise to to separate them, to say no, no, there. This is a sad movie. This is a movie about suicide, so there can't be laughs. And, uh, you know, I want there to be, to be both. Finally, uh, with, your sh with the sheer work, energy, and drive it takes for a first film to be made, how does your next project look easier from here or even more challenging as you seek more avenues on your creative path? Um, great question. It's, uh, well, I learned a lot of things not to do uh, on Our Father uh, from... The, the script writing phase through shooting and through the, the struggle of post-production. So it, that was kind of trial by fire. And I, I'm so thrilled that it is finding its way into the world in the way that it is. But it, it was surprising to me because it had really been a struggle to get it done. But at the same time, my, you know, I have another script done that, that is my, hopefully my next project, but it's also a larger scale film than our father, so, um, and and this one I'm I'm intending to act in it as well, which is Great. maybe biting off more than I can chew. Um, you know, I but, don't know. Uh, <laughs> Writing, directing, and scoring a film seems pretty <laughs> biting off a lot to chew. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Maybe I won't score this one. <laughs> This is Patrick McDonald for HollywoodChicago.com, copyright 2021.